This video is going to introduce us to calculating means by group with R's function LM. If you remember, uh, LM, the function, stands for linear model. So we're going to understand how R's function LM generalizes multiple means. That is, we're going to calculate the mean of some numeric variable by levels of a categorical variable and simple linear regression. We're going to see how this function LM generalizes this multiple means and the simple linear regression models into one unified framework. Now, in other statistics classes, they might call this model ANOVA, analysis of variance for means by group. But that kind of pushes my limit of a whole new world of hypothesis testing that I really try to avoid in introductory courses. So uh, although you may see the phrase ANOVA, analysis of variance, we're just going to call this means by group, and then everything else is going to stay exactly the same. The function LM here is going to generalize for us multiple means and simple linear regression, which makes this video our first step towards the kind of catch-all model of this course named multiple linear regression. Now, if I had to explain to you what we're actually going to do in this video, we are actually going to understand how to numerically encode a categorical variable into a formal model. Uh, categorical variables are those with uh, names or labels such that you can't like math them together. So it's a little tricky at first to understand how we can get variables you can't math together into a formal model that happily allows you to do math on it. And that's what this video is going to introduce us to. Uh, and then as always, we will close with an example in R. But first, let's draw some pictures. So let's imagine using a plot as our base of reference that we have some categorical variable on the x-axis with levels a, b, and c. It doesn't matter what those levels stand for. We're just going to assume there is some categorical variable for which we are going to calculate the mean of these levels with respect to the numerical variables. So let's say level A has mean of whatever that value is, level B has a mean that's slightly bigger than A, and level C has a mean that's slightly smaller than A. What we're going to try to figure out how to do is write out this numerical variable, y, we always think of this as the y-axis, in terms of a linear model. So we're going to make predictions, y hat, of whatever numerical y-axis variable that is, and our model is going to be written out looking like a linear model where the first term might as well be called an intercept. And in fact, we'll use the same variable name, beta subscript 0, red, beta naught, to represent the intercept in this model. Now, the intercept is kind of a funky term here, but I think you'll get over that once you see this inherent connection. So beta naught is really going to be level A's mean. Now, what we're going to do to pick up level B's mean or level C's mean is not um, formally introduce the means of levels B and C themselves, but instead what we're going to do is introduce, oops, that one's a little off, is introduce, I'm just going to draw my picture slightly better. So if B's mean shows up about here, we will introduce another parameter that represents the difference between level A's mean and level B's mean, such that if we add beta 1, that difference between A's mean and B's mean, times what they call an indicator variable for level B, if we added beta naught and beta 1 together, we would get out B's mean. Now, in what sense does it make sense to add 
uh, beta naught and beta 1 together. Well, if you think of this variable b as an indicator variable, that is, it takes on the value 1 if making a prediction for level b, and it takes on a value 0 if not making a prediction for level b. If you think of this as a model where you're trying to predict y hat, that is the mean of any particular group, you would ask yourself, am I trying to make a prediction for a, an observation of level b? And if you are making an observation for uh, making a prediction for an observation from level b, the indicator variable b would take on the value 1. 1 times beta 1 would be beta 1. Beta 1 plus beta naught would give you y hat, the mean for group B. Now, consider trying to make a prediction for group A. If you're making a prediction for group A, you're not making a prediction for level B. So B in this case would be 0. 0 times beta 1 is 0. And beta naught is your uh, mean for level A. So beta naught would be your mean for level A. Now, the only real trick we need to do to get predictions for level C into this is just extend onto this model a new coefficient that represents the difference between, now you got to be careful here, this is the difference between level A and level C. And again, in order to appropriately encode that difference between level A and C, we then have an indicator variable. This time, it's an indicator variable for level C. So we could go through the same logic as before. If we wanted to make a prediction for level C, then the indicator variable for level C would be 1. Since we're making a prediction for level C and not level B, b would be 0. In this case, we'd have c equal to 1, because we're making a prediction for level c. 1 times beta 2 plus beta 0. And in that case, even though be, uh, c's group mean is below beta 0, it would just happen to be the case that beta 2 is negative. So you'd still just take your negative beta 2, your beta 2, which is negative, and add it to beta 0 and you would get out your prediction for level C's mean. This is the strategy we're going to use to encode categorical variables into, notice all these plus terms, a linear model. This is the base strategy you use to encode categorical variables into a linear model. Let's go ahead and see what that looks like in R. We will start with loading all of our favorite and common libraries. And in this video, I'm going to use the data set named Finches, which you can very easily find up on my GitHub repository named data under my username. And it turns out the data set Finches is, as I'm told, uh, all, some of Charles Darwin's original data from the Galapagos Islands. So this is a data set recorded about Finches. I believe all measurements are in centimeters. So here we have the island a particular finch came from the wing length, tail length, beak width, beak height, lower beak length, upper beak length, tarsus length, and middle toe length, all measured in centimeters for any particular finch that came from some island. So we're going to use this data set. And when we're making uh, plots with the x-axis as a categorical variable, as long as you're careful to ensure that R recognizes the categorical variable as a factor, and in this case I know it does, 
then you should be able to do the standard sort of plots when you're looking at multiple means across levels of a categorical variable. So what we are going to do then is explore the mean of beak width within each island from this data set. And what we've done before, just as a reminder, is taken our data set and grouped by island, which I think we're now starting to see the logic behind that. And then we pass the grouped data set to the function summarize in which we calculate the mean of beak width. And we get out a mean of 9.6, so maybe like here-ish for Floriana. And we get out a mean of 10.7, maybe here-ish for San Cristobal. And we get a mean of 10.3, something just a little bit lower than San Cristobal's mean uh, for the island Santa Cruz. And that seems good, but what we're going to now try to do is calculate those same numbers by looking at Floriana's group mean as kind of the base mean, the reference group. And then we're going to calculate differences between 9.62 and 10.7 to get the offset between Floriana and San Cristobal. And then separately, we will look at the offset between Floriana and Santa Cruz. And we're going to do that with a very similar notation we used before, where you're trying to, um, with a linear model, you're trying to predict a numerical y-axis variable by, that's what this tilde is supposed to mean, predict the y-axis variable by some explanatory variable. And in this case, our explanatory variable will be island, but we're taking the time to recognize that the variable island is indeed already a factor in R. If it's not, you would necessarily need to convert island to be a factor in order to carry forward with this specific analysis where you're trying to predict a numerical y-axis variable using one categorical explanatory variable. I'm going to skip that extra notation now since it's just fluff and we already have a factor variable island in our model. We'll fit the model and we'll look at the coefficients of our fitted model. And indeed, you see we get 9.6. Let's understand that uh, summarize is rounding for us, 9.62 for the Look, the intercept is the group mean for the reference level. Now, Floriana happens to be the reference level only for the fact that F comes before S in, uh, on a computer and sorting by letters. If your categorical explanatory variable happened to have lev levels that were numerically encoded, say 1, two, and three, then the intercept would be for level one because one comes before two and three. So all we're recognizing here is that R chooses the reference level, the intercept value, as the first in a sorted list of the levels of the categorical variable you're trying to predict by. So here is the intercept for Floriana, the group mean for Floriana. Here is the offset, which we called beta 1 in our notes previously, such that if you stored this vector of coefficients, you could go beta 1 plus beta 2, and you would get out, although it's named funny, the group mean for San Cristobal. And in fact, that same logic applies. If you just took beta 1 and added to it beta 3, you would get out with a little bit of rounding, the group mean for Santa Cruz. And in fact, this is exactly what we're going for. We now have a model that looks like, let's call it hat for making predictions for beak width, that is equal to beta 1 plus beta 2 times, uh, I will write this out as San 
crystal ball, but I mean to say right here is an indicator variable taking on the value 1 anytime we're trying to make a prediction for sand crystal ball and 0 anytime we are not making a prediction for sand crystal ball. And then we have a third coefficient times Santa Cruz, where Santa Cruz is the indicator variable for any finches from the island Santa Cruz. And in fact, if you look at the model matrix from this fitted model, let's see if we can get away with just looking at the first five rows, you will see that the intercept is constant. It's the reference group. It always shows up, just like this term beta 1 here, always shows up. There's no indicator variable attached to it, so you always have a hidden 1 times beta 1 out front. And it turns out the first observation in this data set is a bird from the island Santa Cruz. We can tell that because it is not a bird from the island San Cristobal. And if it was not a bird from Santa Cruz, this would be a zero. But in fact, it is a bird from Santa Cruz, so this is a one. Maybe down here in the tail of X, here's some other good examples. The last finch in our data set is a finch from the island Floriana. That's because it shows up one here and zero for both San Cristobal and Santa Cruz. And it turns out the 66th finch in our data set is from San Cristobal. We can see that because it is not from Santa Cruz and it is from San Cristobal. This indicator variable strategy is how we go about calculating or how we go about formally including a categorical variable into a linear model. We essentially just denote for each row of our data set uh, ones and zeros for everything outside of the reference group anytime a particular bird belongs to that particular island. And I think, hope you can generalize this idea to other uh, categorical variables, but we'll certainly get practice and homework. So from here, lots of what we can do uh, follows exactly as we did for simple linear regression. We could make a model, or we have made a model, and we could now bootstrap that model by creating a function named boot means that takes a data set and some uh, vector of indices, and we could calculate, look, I'll show you how nice this is. We could calculate the means, which is really the reference group means and offsets, so long as we appropriately index our data set. And then let's return from this function the coefficients of our fitted model. And we've already loaded the library boot, so we can just go ahead and say let's perform the bootstrap using our original data set df and the function boot means and a thousand and one times. Let's run that, and while it's running, we can just go ahead and say boot.ci on the object boot. We'll start with index one because that will be easiest, and ask for the type equal to pers for percentiles. What we get here is a bootstrapped 95% confidence interval for the mean beak width of finches from the island Floriana. So we would say something like, we are 95% confident that the mean beak width for finches from the island Floriana is between 8.9, uh, let's just call it 9 centimeters, and 10.3 centimeters. But what's nice about this is if we move to index 2, and remembering that index 2 in our returned coefficients is an offset relative to Floriana for the island San Cristobal, then what we're getting as a confidence interval here is actually a confidence interval on the difference between the group means of beak width for finches from the island San Cristobal relative to the island Floriana. So we might say something here like we are 95% confident 
that the true population mean difference in beak width for birds on the island San Cristobal relative to the island Floriana is between 0 0.17 and 1.9 centimeters. And despite some awkward language, if you just keep in mind that we are suggesting here, since both ends of this confidence interval are above zero, that there is probably a good chance that the mean beak width of birds from the island San Cristobal is greater than the mean beak width for the birds from Floriana. Now let's just do one more example just so we can get some uh, better understanding of what a strictly positive confidence interval uh, tells us. And we'll get that by looking at the offset for the mean beak width of finches from Santa Cruz relative to Floriana. And if you look at this confidence interval, notice one endpoint of the confidence interval, specifically the lower bound, is negative. And the upper bound of this confidence interval is positive. That's giving us an indication that the mean beak width for finches from the island Santa Cruz is probably not that different than the mean beak width for the finches from Floriana. It's probably not that we're not convinced that those two islands mean beak widths for finches is different because zero is somewhere in here. I'm not saying this is a black and white decision. I'm just saying there is evidence suggesting that uh, there it might be some overlap between the beak widths for um, finches from Floriana and the beak width for finches from Santa Cruz. Now, you should interpret this sentence basically the same way, whether or not the bounds are strictly positive, strictly negative, or somehow uh, cover zero. So we'd say we are 95% confident that the true population mean difference in beak width for birds on the island Santa Cruz relative to island Floriana is between negative 0.2 and 1.5 centimeters. This was our first go at figuring out how to formally include a categorical variable into a linear model. It all comes down to the idea of indicator variables. So if there's anything you should really practice with from this video, it's the idea of exactly what indicator variables are doing for us. They are taking the levels of a categorical variable and turning them into numbers by referencing them as ones and zeros.